uh, thank you for the invitation to be here tonight. I'm very interested to talk about uh, the new public social science of big data. And I speak as someone who's not an expert in big data. I can't, I, I, I'm fascinated by the world around us. I'm not a great expert in computer science. Um, but I have, over a number of years, been very interested in how the social sciences are being transformed by the challenge of big data. And I want to try and explore that tonight with a simple argument, really, that there's been a, a sea change in the nature of social science thinking, and that, like it or not, and many social scientists don't particularly like it, uh, we are now seeing a form of, a form of data-driven analysis, which is really shaping um, the way we do sociology. I want to begin by taking you back to uh, something I wrote uh, 10 years ago, well, nine years ago. Um, a famous paper, and in some, for some people, an infamous paper, um, I wrote with my colleague Roger Burroughs called The Coming Crisis of Empirical Sociology. And the argument in this paper was a simple one. It was to say that most social scientists, when they do research, do two or three things. And the two or three things they do is they interview people, or they do surveys and get people to fill in questionnaires. A few people also do ethnography, but that's not very common these days. And my argument was this, that, that those methods have been around in the social sciences for decades, and they haven't actually transformed that much. And yet, over the last 20 or 30 years, we have seen the proliferation of digital data. And I argued um, that sociologists had to take this world seriously. We couldn't just afford to sit on the margins of this world. We had to try and get our hands dirty and think about how we can use these kinds of data um, for our own purposes. Now, this was a very controversial argument. Um, one of the referees uh, of the paper said it was the, it was the worst paper he'd ever read. Um, fortunately, the other referee liked it, and it in indicated very much the flavour of the dispute about whether social scientists should use this data or just steer clear of it. Um, and there are many critical comments made about the problems of you know, big data, digital data. Um, uh, so, for instance, the fact that much uh, bigger data does not, com does not contain any information on motives of people, on, on the hermeneutic dimension of that of life, whereas if you interview people, you can ask at length why they do things, but you, c you can't usually do that using big data. All you get are the traces of people's credit card histories or telephone histories or go Google searches or whatever it is. Similarly, it's often said that uh, you can't really establish causal links using this data. You can do fantastic patterns, you can explore you know, networks between all sorts of um, connections or practices or transactions, but you can't really understand what is causing what in the way which you conventionally can using various kinds of modelling techniques in the social sciences. So um, it's quite a common critique of big data to say that it, can't, you know, it looks very interesting, but have we actually been able to prove something called something else in a non, a non fairly trite way, in a deep way? Similarly, uh, the world of big data is not a neutral world. It's not a neutral world because um, big data is only generated if you are part of the community of big data users, if you've got a mobile phone or if you're on the internet. And this is a world which is skewed towards the rich and powerful. So if you rely upon big data, then there's a kind of inherent power bias in the sources you use. Um, and so that was actually the seminar a few days ago and they said, well, isn't, isn't the idea of big data another example of the way that the north of the globe has more power than the south of the globe, where there's an informal economy, where, where things aren't recorded and where they, these activities are invisible to um, transactions. Also, um, and this is something I'm gonna talk about in a minute, one of the issues we have in social science, if you take a kind of Thomas Kuhn approach to how social science develops, you need exemplars of good studies which show how you can use big data in an interesting way. And it can be argued we don't yet have many good exemplars of how the deployment of social science data, or big data rather, can actually improve our understanding and our analysis of social world. So you can see the stakes. And I think, really, this, this is a very serious debate because the future of the social sciences is at stake. You can argue the 20th century 
was the rise of the social sciences. The, all, in, in most nations, the social sciences become massively more powerful as the 20th century advances. You could argue, in a pessimistic view, that the 21st century could see the decline of the social sciences and the rise of the natural sciences again, because you're now finding physicists and computer scientists doing social research using big data and ignoring what sociologists do. Uh, so it, the, the future of academic disciplines are very much tied up with this debate. I think the fundamental issue is, you know, you get all these sort of graphics. Uh, I'm sure I'll see some in a minute, um, miserable. But what, you know, how do you make sense of them sociologically? How do you actually, I mean, you get all sorts of beautiful pictures and patterns and uh, diagrams, but the fundamental issue is, um, so what? You know, what? What does it actually tell us about the world in a way which is meaningful and advances our understanding? And I actually want to argue today that, in fact, we are now seeing um, social scientists beginning to make sense of these kinds of innovative data sources. Um, and I'm going to argue that really what we've seen is uh, the rise of very powerful modes of social science thinking which depart from traditional modes. Traditional modes of social science thinking have predominantly been theoretical, they've been philosophical, they've been historical, um, and fairly abstract. And instead, that what we're now seeing is high-profile social scientists uh, being much less focused around theory and much more f focused around using data of all kinds. Big, I mean, as I'll say, not all of them use the big data label, and talking about big data may be a bit confusing, but it is a data-driven kind of analysis. So we're really seeing a very radical shift in the repertoire of how social scientists um, establish themselves as commentators on affairs and how they come to the attention of governments, of policy makers, of the media. Um, for those of you who are social scientists or intellectuals, you may hopefully know these four people. Um, I guess you'll know Ulrich Beck and Jürgen Habermas, uh, very eminent German uh, thinkers. Um, Anthony Giddens, former director of the London School of Economics. Michel Foucault. These are, so my point is this. Th um, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, these would have been the leading social scientists of their day. Everyone listened to them. Had a huge influence on public debate. None of them knew much about data. Um, they were not data people. They were people who had a fantastic command of history, philosophy, social theory, um, and very good at synthesizing. Um, they were not people who sat in front of the computer and analyzed surveys or data. Um, but that is what, I mean, I, I, it's a challenge I threw out to you. I, I threw this out to my students a few days ago, is to say, um, can we find equivalent to those people today? That kind of intellectual, I don't think you can. I think we've actually seen a shift away from those people who, have, who make grand claims, the risk society, in the case of Beck, um, neoliberalism in the case of Foucault or whatever. Those kinds of grand claims are no longer so significant. But instead, you are finding other kinds of social scientists coming to the fore. Um, I'm going to talk about three of them now. None of them use the big data word particularly, but they are all doing data analysis, and it's the data which is making their name famous. Um, Robert Putnam, Harvard political scientist. I mean, I'm, not, I'm not sure how prominent this book was in Germany, but certainly in, in the US and in the UK. It, it, ten years ago, this was the dominant book. It influenced governments all over the world. The argument that people were no longer as civically engaged as they used to be. And the point is, Putnam, you know, Putnam is a very eminent political scientist, but it was a book which had lots of data in it. Not that this is fairly conventional data in his case, it's many surveys, but also data from membership registers, um, from all sorts of different sources mashed together. Secondly, um, I'm not sure how, how familiar this book is in, in Germany, but Richard Wilkinson and Kate Pickett are two British ep epidemiologists um, who wrote this book called The Spirit Level, which is a bestseller in Britain. Um, it's sold uh, well over a quarter of a million copies. Um, I'll, show you, I'll show, you, show you some of its pages in a minute. This is an argument saying that more unequal societies are worse on a great variety of criteria. They're less healthy, people aren't as happy, people don't live as long, 
Um, so it's a very wide-ranging argument, but it's an argument based on massive uses of data. It's not based on theory, particularly. And the final example is, of course, this guy, who you will all know. Uh, he published this book last year. Um, more than half a million copies sold in the world. Um, it's true, most people don't, don't get to the end of it. But nonetheless, it's had an enormous influence. And the book it is fundamentally a data book. So you know, we're in this very interesting situation where the, 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 the really powerful intellectuals, powerful social scientists, um, are very different. I mean, Piketty is a very different intellectual from Foucault or Habermas in the way he, he does his work. And what I think each of them does in different kinds of ways is they have a very skillful knack of taking multiple data sources, some digital, some survey-based, some linked to government records like taxation data, health data, and they mash those data sources together. But this is the, this is the challenge of big data is always everything can become so complicated and so complex you, you, you lose sight of the, of the big argument. And what they do is they have a way of visualising basically one thing which they keep banging home time and again. So it's, a, it's an enormous skill in actually cutting to the story which really matters. And they do that by using visualisation tools. Now most sociologists um, don't particularly like visualisations. They don't, uh, after the Second World War, sociologists normally did things by writing lots of words or by having figures and numbers. They didn't do visualisations. I mean, that, that would apply to Ulrich Beck and Anthony Giddens and Foucault and Habermas as much as anybody else. But also, um, Piketty and Wilkinson and Pickett and Putnam are not really doing causal social science in the conventional sense. They are looking at descriptive patterns. But, you know, often social scientists say it's only description, it doesn't matter very much. Actually, I mean, I think Piketty shows this particularly strongly, description is really powerful if you do it in a way which shows recurring patterns. Um, and so this is really very challenging for social science repertoires. Um, about the way in which what social science involves today, which when it gets out into the public realm and influences policymakers, is it's a different kind to that which was influential uh, 20 or 30 years ago. So let me give some examples of how it works in practice. This is the way Putnam proceeds. So Putnam's big argument is that um, in America and in main nations, but particularly in America, basically the membership of many clubs increases after the Second World War and then it declines. And so the argument is there's a crisis of social capital in America. People are no longer being so civically engaged. How does he make that case? He makes that case by showing figures like this time and again in the book. There's a simple visual here, which is being mobilised. It's built up on a variety of databases. In this case, I think it's to do with the membership of bowling clubs. Um, here's another one I took, which is to do with membership of trade unions. Again, the same kind of peak. And so it's a very skillful way, actually, that, of showing how you tell a story by repeat visual, like, visualizations, which are a bit different each time. So there's a bit of a nuance, bit of a, a bit of a nuance. But the reader, as they read the book, it has a simple message in a sense, um, and it's a very powerful message. And it's, a, it's a descriptive message. You know, there's been a big rise of collective membership and there's a big decline. What do we do about it? Um, but that's the kind of message which has been very influential in the policy world. The version which Wilkinson and Pickett do is a bit different. It's a different kind of visualisation, but it's, again, repeated time and again in their book. So, I mean, what they're doing here is on the, on the x-axis, you're contrasting countries with high and low income inequality. And on the y-axis, you're, uh, you're array, arraying countries according to whether they, the health and social problems are worse or better. Um, and the point is that... Um, when there's high levels of income inequality, as there is particularly in the USA, um, that's when these measures on the left are, are the worst. So even though USA is a very rich country in general, and an average, it's a very unequal country too, and therefore generally health and social problems are worse. On the other hand, if you look at Japan, which has a low income inequality, then the uh, 
the social problems much better. And there's a fairly straightforward line. There's about 20 countries on the line, and it shows there's a kind of, there's a kind of a correlation there, a kind of pattern at work. And this basic graphic is produced, reproduced time and again in their book. Here's another example. Um, income inequality on the x-axis, and then this time we got mental illness. And again, USA is in the right, top right-hand corner. Um, and Japan is on the bottom left-hand corner. So it's kind of just repeating itself. But by keeping on uh, blasting in with these same kind of graphics, you get the message. And it's a very skillful way of finding a crisp way of visualizing patterns. Um, what you can also do, if you have this technique, is you can then, occasionally you can change it. You can kind of vary it while sticking to the same repertoire. So in this case, the x-axis is the gross national income per head. Uh, and the point is this. Um, in this case, I mean, what workers and Pickett are arguing is, that is actually to say what matters is inequality, not income. So income shouldn't be so significantly linked in to um, whether you're happy or not, and it's not. So New Zealand and Norway have the same levels of happiness, even though they have very different levels of prosperity. So this is an argument against classic near classical e economics arguments that the main thing is to have a prosperous economy. But I hope you see the point here. It's a very effective use of visualization, which are repeated, but then kind of tweaked a bit to kind of make their message. And this approach really reaches its kind of, its, its apogee with Piketty's work. Um, because Piketty's work, 650 pages or whatever it is, is littered with versions of this figure. Um, and it's, a lovely, so it's the opposite of uh, Putnam. Putnam was the mountain, uh, and Piketty is the valley. Um, it's basically it's the story is uh, in this case it's to do with the proportion of um, the top percentile in the total income so the higher this the higher this line it means the more unequal it is the more the, the top one percent have the lion's share of the national income and the argument is obviously in the Victorian period before the First World War highly unequal the top one percent has a high proportion of the national income that declines into the middle years of the 20th century, but it's rising again. And it's now we met, we're now moving back towards the inequality of the 19th century. Um, it's a very crisp way of showing that pattern. Again, he's using a, a, a very... Uh, and uh, Piketty is also important in terms of the big data argument because um, I mean, he never uses the word big data as far as I know, but actually he is using big data. Um, he is, he's made this important argument that you, you can't use household surveys to ask about income because if you ask people how much do you earn they don't tell you realistically um, yeah, particularly if you're at the top end you tend not to be honest about it but if you and he therefore says you've got to use taxation data um, obviously people don't always exactly tell the truth with taxation data either but the point is this it, um, the survey company never comes back and checks and say you tick the wrong box whereas taxation people can so you're more likely to think I better give my uh, my correct income, and once you're into the world of um, taxation data, this is administrative data, huge databases, and there's a potential for using forms of digital big data in these kinds of analyses. So he's now developing, or well, he has been developing with his colleagues, the world top incomes database, which is a kind of big data database. So here again, uh, here's the U shape, and here's another version of the U shape, which is a done a bit differently and I, I think it's again it's a, it's a lovely way of representing social change so here he's got this very clever idea of looking at the proportion of capital assets if you like wealth as a as a percentage of the national income and his, so his argument is in up until the first world war about 600 there's about 600 percent of the national income was was was, was stored in the form of various kinds of capital, housing, land, savings, investments and such like. That rapidly declines in the middle years of the 20th century as uh, partly to do with the effect of war, partly to do with redistribution. <coughs> and then uh, it's been rising again in the more recent period. And then what he does, again, this is rather like Wilkinson and Pickett, same U shape here in the black line um, but what he does is he, um, inter he interjects that with the 
line with the white squares, which is the rate of growth, and this becomes part of his argument that actually um, the issue here is that uh, the rate of growth tends to be less than the rate of return, um, and there, therefore there's always a tendency for capital to ex the growth of capital, the growth of wealth to exceed the growth rate in the economy. So he's making an argument through a clever use of visuals, which are the same but slightly tweaking each time. And this links into his famous kind of R is greater than G argument. So this is really interesting. I mean, if you know, if you go back to Karl Marx, Weber, Durkheim, um, all the great social theorists until the last few years, none of them used visualizations. Yet these three, I would say, that certainly in the British context, those three writers have been the most influential in policy terms, in shaping debates in the social sciences, and they're doing it by a very skillful use of data. Um, and I think that it's worth us bringing out the skill involved here. It is not, it, the, the skill it is about not getting too stuck into the details of the data. It's about standing back and finding a technique of crisp, crisply summarizing one trend again and again and again. So it is in many respects, it's, it's a kind of intuitive, historical, hermeneutic approach to data. And it involves hooking the visualizations with a story and with a theory. So these concepts, so in Putnam's case, it's social capital. In Piketty's case, it's capital, which has a kind of battery of links to Marx and various economists. But it also is a story about historical change and then about that can be backed up visually. Um, so in a way, although, I mean, and, and also, uh, actually, didn't say this in the slide, they're also interested because they're also very political in certain ways. I mean, they're all making political arguments. Um, Wilkinson and Pickett very clearly, you know, uh, and they make no bones about this, uh, are very left-wing, very socialist, trying to show that inequality is a bad thing. Piketty, similarly, um, they're also, interestingly, sort of makes, makes it clear he's not a Marxist, but he's obviously on the left. Putnam, uh, more of a kind of, um, I guess, a, a liberal Democrat, American style, communi communita communitarian. But the politics is central to what they're doing. It's not a kind of empiricist, you know, let's see what the data says. The politics is really informing the way they're interpreting the data. So w what they're all doing is they're putting data sets together, which aren't just the conventional data sets of surveys. It includes all kinds of data, digital, it could be stored data, it could be any kind of data, but then they web together. They're not doing complex models, even though in you know, Piketty could do the econometrics if he wanted to, but he doesn't do that. He, they use simple univariate and bivariate descriptive figures and visualizations. And the basic approach is to context, contextualize uh, the variables which interest them over time or in space. So looking at broader patterns um, and seeing, looking at the, the trends either between areas or over time. So um, what's the implications for big data? So when, when, when I was uh, writing my, my paper 10 years ago on the coming crisis, I was, I was quite pessimistic in some ways. And I said, well, the social scientists aren't doing, big, they're not really doing data analysis in an impressive way. And the, work, the, the high ground is being taken by the computer scientists by the people who are doing amazing work with uh, data sets. But actually, uh, my, I've changed my mind a bit now, because these three think people, and I think Piketty is the best example of this, are now very much using data. As I say, they're not calling it big data, bit, and that's interesting. It's interesting as to whether that term is a helpful one. It has such a lot of power, but um, the fact that they are doing data analysis, and that data analysis is so powerful, um, is interesting. And the fact that they don't need to talk about it is big data is even more telling perhaps. And arguably the debate about big data conflates a number of different things. One of them is the data itself, which can take all sorts of forms. Um, Google searches or tweets or uh, taxation <coughs> records or whatever. Um, but you can, so you've got that. Um, and so Piketty, for instance, is using taxation data. So in that respect, he is using various kinds of big data. He doesn't call it that. But the analytical strategies, which you may want to use to analyze the data, don't, you know, you can use very conventional 
method to analyze big data if you want to. You can use a regression model to be an app for donkey's ears. You don't need to use computer scientific tools. Well, you can do, but my, my point is this. You, should, you need to separate out the analytical strategies from the data itself. And then thirdly, too, how you make an argument with the data. Um, data doesn't speak for itself. And never ha you know, that, that's not what happens. Data has to be interpreted and given sense to. Um, and that's why, why I think Piketty and Putman and Wilkinson and Pickett are so, so powerful. So um, my argument, you know, as I said, I was 10 years ago, I was thinking sociology, the social sciences could be going down because we, we can't really speak this world of big data or this, big, this world of transactional and administrative data. And the, the high ground will be taken by natural scientists and by computer scientists. But I've, I think I'm changing my mind because uh, social scientists have actually shown themselves, certainly these three social scientists have shown themselves to be really adept in using data to be very influential, in, both in the world of intellectual life and in influencing policy and in raising big issues. And so the whole growth of interest in inequality, which has been a massively increasing issue, is driven by the work of Piketty and also uh, Wilkinson and Pickett. And I think the point is this, social scientists, unlike computer scientists, for instance, or physicists, can come to data sources with a much more creative and historical orientation to what they're looking at. And they're much better able, I think, to since not get too bogged down in the detail or the, or the beautiful maps or whatever it happens to be and find the kind of kernel of the arguments which is, is what will interest people. And therefore, you know, perhaps, and this is the fi my final point, perhaps we're going to see the rise again of a sort of inter interdisciplinary and very historically oriented social science because again, Piketty is an amazing, an economist, is going back to the year, to the year 1700. You know, that's a 300 year period, he's straddling all, all that period of time. And there's a kind of merger here between historical sensibility and a social scientific sensibility, which is very exciting. Um, and you know, the world of big data for this kind of uh, approach to social science is a very exciting one, in which I think we're going to see some very interesting and very important work in the years to come. Thank you.